You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is May 21st, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, IgE immune responses. Our presenter is Dr. Christina Chacho. She's in the section of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. now and uh, Dr. Chacho is going to take over so I'm going to put him over to Dr. Dr. Christina Chacho. All right. So today um, we are almost done with the about text. We're on chapter 19. Um, although this lecture is sort of made uh, composed of last year's text and then a, a lecture I had done for something else try and bring in some more, more relevant information than that was contained um, in, this, in this chapter. Next week's Memorial Day, and um, we will be here. That's right. I will no be conference here. next week. Anyone else is welcome to come. We can always do it at home from home. I'll just keep the picture. No. I'll call. And the week after that, uh, we'll do Chapter 20, which is um, immune deficiency, and then we're done for the year. Okay, so immediate hypersensitivity, also known as ATP atopic disease or allergy, and it is um, when IgE is associated with cells, it's cross-linked by antigen, and then several mediators that are released that will increase vascular permeability, vasodilation, and bronchial visceral smooth muscle contraction. It is the most common disorder of immunity worldwide, affecting about 20% of the U.S. population. Of course, this phenomena is more common um, in industrialized nations than it is in third world countries. So the hallmarks of hypersensitivity are Th2 <coughs> activation and IgE production. So the sequence of events in a typical reaction is that you are exposed to an antigen or an allergen. Then you have activation of your T cell, so probably by the presenting dendritic cell, programs the T cell to become a Th2 type cell. And then it is going to command a B cell to start IgE production. The IgE is going to go into circulation. It's going to bind to mast cells. And on your next exposure to that antigen or allergen, it's going to trigger the mast cell to release its content. Um, so certainly we know that there is a genetic predisposition um, to developing atopic disease. And there's actually a table at the end of the chapter that reviews some of the most common genetic um, causes. And we know that the allergens are usually common environmental proteins or they are connected to a um, protein. So this is uh, figure 19.1 on page 426, and it basically just goes over this reaction. Whereas you are exposed to an allergen, um, the allergen causes uh, B cells to, to secrete IgE and T cells to become a Th2 type profile. Why this happens as opposed to uh, B cell secreting IgG and a T, a T cell becoming a Th1 phenotype, we don't know. This is certainly one of the big uh, research interests in allergy today. Um, but once you have your IgE, it's going to um, sit on an SC epsilon R1 receptor, which we'll talk about more. It is going to be ready for the next time you're exposed to this allergen or antigen. It's going to cross-link the IgE, and you are going to have release of mediators, including your immediate mediators like histamine and then your late phase reactions, um, such as the cytokines and leukotrienes. So IgE. IgE is what is responsible for sensitizing mast cells. It is uh, what provides recognition for the antigen for the immediate hypersensitivity reaction. So atopic patients produce IgE in higher levels than um, normal folks or otherwise healthy folks, um, and we don't know why. 
So normal individuals tend to synthesize IgM and IgG and very little IgE. Um, so the antigens, like I mentioned before, proteins are bound to proteins. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, T cells, um, in response to the allergens, will take on a Th2 phenotype, and then they secrete several cytokines, including IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. So IgE production is dependent on IL-4 and IL-13. IL-5 activates eosinophil, so one of the late, later mediators of a Th2 type reaction. And then IL-13 will also stimulate epithelial cells to secrete mucus. So mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils are the effector cells of mediate hypersensitivity. They have cytoplasmic granules that contain the mediators of the allergic reaction, and they produce lipid mediators and cytokines <coughs> on activation that will induce inflammation will happen um, in a more delayed uh, way as other um, immune reactions tend to do. Um, so a bit about mast cells. Mast cells are ubiquitous granulocytes that are primarily found in the mucosal membrane and skin, so somewhere where there's going to be a port of entry for a pathogen or a potential port of entry for a pathogen. So they are um, largely responsible for immediate hypersensitivity responses, including asthma, rhinitis, urticaria, anaphylaxis. Um, but we now know that they are more than just um, have this immediate response. They also have a late phase where they can produce cytokines and the cotrienes. Um, so they are also critical regulators in innate defense, although we don't tend to think of them that like that. So they were first described by Paul Ehrlich in 1877 in Germany, and he found them to be something that stains metachromatically. So what does that mean? Uh, H and E stain or aniline stains. So remember, the, the H goes in first, and it's going to stain things basic blue, like the nucleus of cells always is. And then the E comes in, and it's acidic, and it's going to uh, stain a nice red. So. Um, Mast cells are metachromatic. They are going to have some blue basic granules, and they're actually going to have some red um, acidic toned granules as well. They're metachromatic. For the fit bowl, this is Paul Ehrlich. His picture seems to come up every year. Commit it to memory. Good question. That picture is a different one. <laughs> I think it's this one. That very picture. Okay. But it doesn't have his name underneath it. Oh, I usually cut that out. In general, if you um, Google all the famous allergists, and the first one on Google image, the first image on Google image that comes up is always one they use. So clearly, whoever wrote the questions is that. Well, because I feel like we've seen a bunch of black like and white Rich pictures Gallo. of old men. Yeah. Like, which one's that one? Kind of looks like Rich Gallo. Uh, so he named the cells that he saw mast zelen. A mast in German means feeding or fattening. Uh, they are 9 to 12 micrometers in diameter, and they have numerous cytoplasmic granules, 0.3 to 0.5 um, micrometers, which make up about half the weight and volume of the cell. And then they have thin, elongated folds of the plasma membrane, a peripherally placed, unsegmented nucleus. This one. Uh, the only bad part about this picture is it doesn't have this nucleus does not look as peripherally placed as we typically see them. In fact, I think maybe these are better, so you have sort of this peripheral place. But this picture nicely shows some of these elongated folds of plasma membranes, and then of course the cytoplasm, which has lots of preformed granules waiting to immediately um, immediately come out of the cell for a reaction. So they are di derived from a pluripotent CD34 positive, KIT positive, IL-3 receptor positive, SC epsilon receptor negative stem cell in the bone marrow. And then as they go into circulation, they lose their CD34 designation in IL-3, and they become KIT positive, SC epsilon R1 positive. And then in the tissue, they will actually differentiate into a phenotype, either MCT, MCTC, or MCC cells. Uh, this is just a picture demonstrating that. So you have your um, stem cell in the bone marrow, 
that's going to be IL-3 receptor. So it obviously needs IL-3 for development. It has KIT receptor, which in the periphery um, is going to be um, the receptor for stem cell factor, which is going to be the main growth factor for mast cells. Um, but it's going to lose its uh, CD34 and its IL-3, and it's going to upregulate SCX1, R1, R3, and then become a phenotype MCT, MCTC, or we also know there's just MCC-type mast cells. Um, so what are these main receptors and their cytokines? IL-3 receptor, so this is the one that's found early on, and this is um, obviously a receptor for IL-3, so it's IL-3, IL-3. Three receptor interaction is one of the main growth factors for the progenitor of mast cells. And then a lifelong stem cell factor, which binds to KIT, you will also see this called C-KIT, which is actually the gene name for it, um, is one of, uh, the lifelong one of the uh, main growth factors for mast cells. So IL-4, IL-4 receptor interaction will downregulate to KIT expression and then induce this SC epsilon R1. IgE obviously binds IgC epsilon R1, not exactly cytokine, but fit nicely in the table that way. And here are phenotypes of mast cells. This is actually in your first aid text. So you can have MCT cells which secrete only tryptase, and they are found in the lungs, the intestine, and the mucosa. These are great board questions, this table. MCTC secrete tryptase, chymase, carboxypeptidase, and peptidase G. And these uh, are more ubiquitously found in the skin, blood vessels, lung, GI submucosa, eyes, and synovium. And actually, what I tried to look up before, and I didn't find a good answer, is I believe different parts of the eye have different phenotypes of mast cells. Dr. Bielleri is coming on next. Maybe we can ask him that, because I think mm -hmm. that um, is good uh, for its question, the conjunctiva and the uh, the retina, maybe he knows that offhand, I don't know. I couldn't find it. MCC um, produce chymase only. They're found in lymph nodes, in uh, intestinal submucosa, and salivary glands. Okay, so um, just a quick word about basophils and eosinophils, because we always sort of forget what they look like. Uh, so in H&E stain, they don't stain um, this dramatically, but basically, uh, the basic basophils stain blue. So in H&E stains, uh, the granules are going to be this basic blue color, and you can actually sort of see the nucleus, which is always going to be a basic blue. On H&E, so an eosinophil <coughs> is always going to the H. It's going to stain things basic, so H comes in first, and it's going to stain the nucleus, but it's not going to stain the granules in the cytoplasm. The E is going to come in, and it's going to stain these very red. So eosin stains things acidic or eosinophilic. So you have these nice red um, stains, but it's actually the H, the hemat hematoxylin, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. And it's going to stain um, the blue, and it's not going to get any of this eosin staining or eosinophilic staining, yeah. just eosinophil. so you get eosinophilic staining. Neutrophils, of course, their um, nucleus is still going to be stained and be blue, but it is going to be a very pale pink color. It's going to be very neutral. It's not going to stain well with either the eosin or the hematoxylin. Okay, so... Um, the way they're called neutrophils because they're neutral? That's exactly it. Wow. Neutrophils are neutral, basophils are basic, and eosinophils are eosinophilic. You should call them acidic pills. Acidic pills. They acid. could also be called acidic pills. Okay. Probably won't find it in the literature that much. No. <laughs> okay, so uh, signaling, we're going to go into more depth, but here is a broad overview of mast cell signaling. You have your uh, receptor for IgE, your SC epsilon R1 receptor. So uh, whenever you name a receptor, Okay, so the R is for a receptor. Uh, the epsilon, so this is for what type of uh, antibody it's going to bind to. So if there's an IgG receptor, it'd be FC gamma R1 or 2 or 3. There can be many different receptors or um, FC alpha R1. 
so the SC uh, speaks to what part of the antibody it binds to. It binds to the SC portion. So this receptor binds to the SC portion of an IgE molecule, and this is the predominant receptor. There's also SC, X1, R2. Um, but after you get IgE, it takes antigen to cross-link IgE. It takes more than one IgE bound to your mast cell. You're going to get signaling through the cytoplasm to the nucleus, but the signaling is going to cause immediate degranulation, so you get a very, very quick reaction of these preformed granule contents like histamine, proteases, and the chemotaxic factors. And of course, you get your characteristic wheel and flare or anaphylactic type reaction. But then later on, you're going to get new synthesis of cytokines or um, membrane phospholipids turning into the leukotrienes and prostaglandins, which can cause the, that second um, phase of the reaction. So mast cells, basal cells express high affinity IgE receptors called the SC epsilon R1, which we just talked about. Okay, so SC epsilon R1 molecule, what does it look like? It is made of an alpha binding chain, a beta chain that is used for signaling, as well as two gamma chains that are used for signaling. So alpha, beta, gamma, gamma. And here it is. Uh, this is from the book. This is. Uh, figure 19.3 on page 431. So here you have your alpha chain with two immunoglobulin-like domains, which is going to bind the SC portion of IgE. Of course, the FAB sec uh, portion is available to bind the antigen or allergen. It is connected to uh, a beta chain and two gamma chains. One intracellular portion of the beta chain is going to have an ITAM as well as both beta uh, gamma chains are going to have ITAMs. And these ITAMs, of course, are always what starts cell signaling. All right, so this is all you need to know, and we got it done. So this is the LIN-SIC pathway. Where else have we seen a LIN-SIC pathway? In the T cells. Uh, T cells. T cells. Exactly. So it's very similar to B cell signaling. So what, is, what do T cells use? Uh, that. Uh, yeah. Lick, lick. That, that, that thing. Exactly. What about cytokine? Cytokine? Barbecue restaurant? Jack that. Jack that. Jack, jack that makes you secrete cytokines after you eat it. <laughs> Hyperinflammatory. <laughs> when they do. That won't, <laughs> that won't work for anywhere else except Kansas City. It's not, okay. it's not broadly applicable. Um, Okay, cross-linking of SC epsilon R1 by IgE or other mediators. The first thing that happens in mast cell activation. So you get cross-linking and then you get LIN, which is a circuit tyrosine kinase. It becomes activated and phosphorylates the ITAMs on SC epsilon R1 beta and gamma chains. You get an increased association of LIN with the beta chain and then the ZAP-related tyrosine kinase, which is sick. Um, associates with the gamma chain ITAM. And then sick phosphorylates LAT. All right, so let's look at this up close. Uh, you get cross-linking, and what does LIN do? LIN phosphorylates the ITAMs on both the beta chains and the gamma chain. Um, LIN is going to be uh, become more close, closely associated with the ITAM on the beta chain, and then these phosphorylate um, uh, phosphorus sites are going to be docking stations for sick, and then sick is going to be able to phosphorylate this adapter protein LAT. Okay, so what's next? Um, phospholipase C will catalyze PIP2 to make IP3 and DAG. We've talked about this all before. IP3 in turn liberates calcium, and calcium causes degranulation. This all happens very quickly. Calcium can actually also start arachidonic liberation from the nuclear membrane for the eventual making of prostaglandins and leukotrienes. And then DAG can actually be metabolized to form arachidonic acid. So where does this happen? OK, so LIN phosphorylates the ITAMs, form a docking station for SICK, which phosphorylates LAT. Uh, this phos uh, phosphorus site on the LAT uh, start phospholipase C which can change PIP2 into DAG IP3. IP3 um, liberates calcium, which is going to cause an immediate degranulation. 
So what else does LAT do? It will also provide a docking station for GRAB2, which links to SOS and activates the RAS RAFMAP kinase pathway, which leads to activation of ERK1 or 2 jump C38, which initiates transcriptions to make cytokines. So once again, LIN phosphorylates uh, ITAMs, serves as a docking station for SICK, SICK phosphorylates LAT. So we've talked about phospholipase ATC, but also what can happen is GRAB will dock on the uh, LAT. In association with SOS, it goes through the RAS MAP kinase pathway to the nucleus, where it is going to upregulate uh, transcription and eventual translation of cytokines to be secreted. This group Goldberg Berg machine, it's not something you're making up. This was actually discovered. This is what it really is. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? But so it's just someone's like life work, I figure. Mm -hmm. Oh, I bet this is like well, 100 people's people life work. work. <laughs> you know, but I mean, it seems like a Rube Goldberg contraption. I mean, who would have come up with something like this? But it's just wow. the way it evolved. All right. Um, are we all clear on So that? it's the RAS map kind of that then goes to the arachidonic acid, because we were talking it, earlier about also can. So okay. arachidonic acid can be liberated in a couple different ways. Okay. Alright. Alright. All right. So I think really Lin sick. If you get those first two mediators for each one, that's gonna help you along. Whatever you hear the RAS map kinase, we know that leads to cytokines, right? Transcription, translation. Um, HIP2, DAD, we kind of get a sense associated with calcium. So some of those big, broad ideas can be applied to, to many different things. All right, so what gets released? Um, activated mast cells will release the biogenic amines, which are the preformed mediators like histamine, as well as lipid mediators like prostaglandins and lipotrienes. These things are going to cause vascular leak, so characteristic wheel and flare. It's also going to cause bronchoconstriction, so acute wheezing and things like anaphylaxis and intestinal, <laughs> intestinal hypermobility, like the vomitors for anaphylaxis. However, activation of the mast cell will also um, get upregulation of the production of cytokines, which is going to lead generalized inflammation. Um, you also get enzymes produced that can eventually lead to tissue damage and fibrosis. Similarly, eosinophils. Um, have preformed cationic granule proteins such as major, major basic protein and eosinophilic cationic protein. If there's one thing you know about eosinophils, know that it contains major basic protein. So these are very important in killing of parasites. Um, it also produces enzymes that also can lead to tissue damage. Okay, so this is a table. Um, uh, it's on 430 chapter, uh, sorry, page 430, it's table 19-2. Unfortunately, um, from the website, you can't download tables anymore, so all these tables are going to be old. Uh, this one actually looks pretty similar, though. So it's comparing mast cells and basophils with eosinophils and some of the differences. So one of the big differences is that eosinophils do not have prostaglandin D2. Uh, eosinophils also are solely the bearers of major basic protein. One of the things, though, that I think um, is very popular to quiz about is the difference between mast cells and basophils, because we always like to think of basophils as the blood version of mast cells. And for probably 99.9% .9 of the population, that's fair, and then there's the small percentage population of people who study basophils and probably hate that comparison. How, so what's the difference? Unlike mast cells, basophils do not produce tryptase, chymase, carboxypeptidase. I think that is fairly easy to remember. These are mast cell specific things. Prostaglandin D2 and leukotriene B4 are not produced by basophils and they're produced by mast cells. Also opioids don't cause basophils to degranulate. Okay. They cause mast cells to degranulate. That sounds like a good high yield bit of knowledge. Okay, so uh, the mast cell mediators, histamine, histamine can obviously work through two different types of receptors, actually, well, more than two different types of receptors, but two types of receptors covered here. So type 1 increases venular permeability, bronchial and intestinal. 
maximum smooth muscle contraction, increased nasal mucus production, wine pulse pressure, increased heart rate, cardiac output, flushing, increased neutrophilin, eosinophil, chemotaxis. And type 2, of course, I always think of increasing gastric acid secretion. It also increases venular permeability, airway mucus production, and inhibits neutrophil and eosinophil influx. This is from the book somewhere. This is figure 198. I'm ported to page 438, which basically shows that, well, it shows the intradermal reaction. This could also be characteristic of our skin prick test, where the um, allergen or antigen is administered, and you get the very immediate wheel and flare type reaction, where you get uh, vasodilation congested from the activated mast cells. Uh, other mast cell mediators include proteoglycans, which would include heparin and chondroitin. So what does heparin do? It actually stabilizes the histamine within the granules. It's an anticoagulant. It also can inhibit the complement cascade and potentially eight angiogenic factors. Chondroitin is also an anticoagulant that increases elasticity and in cartilage. Prostanoids, the catrines, are responsible for pain. Fever, edema, induces leukocyte activity. Uh, this is figure 1910 on 441 that shows the mediators and uh, treatments in asthma. So, what are the, so in asthma, what do we have? We have the characteristic mast cell degranulation, which we've talked about. So, what are some of the things? Um, that get released. Um, well, I guess it doesn't have the immediate um, histamines. Of course, we use antihistamines to combat. Of course, the leukotrienes are produced. Chromalin um, works very high up in this. And then the leukotriene antagonists will work uh, farther down or uh, peripherally. Uh, corticosteroids and chromalin will both work um, to stop cytokine production. So what are mast cells supposed to do? They're supposed to expel parasites by using serotonin, leukotriene, histamine, and chymases. Mast cells will also stay positive uh, for LL37, which is the catholicidin. Catholicidins are antimicrobial, like we've talked about before, and they also have cytotoxic um, activity to fungi, viruses, and protozoans. Uh, they will also recruit neutrophils and more muscles. And adaptive defense is a source of NIP1-beta, which recruits T cells. It's important in contact, cutaneous contact sensitivity, and bacterial infection. So the source of leukotriene B4, which recruits memory T cells, and can polarize the immune response to the Th2 type phenotype. Okay, so mass, where are mast cells found in pathologic conditions? Of course, urticaria, we know there's an anti-SC-epsilon R1 and probably an anti-IgE that are both responsible um, for an autoimmune type of urticaria. Uh, of course, anaphylaxis, where there's massive degranulation of mast cells, and then mastocytosis, of course, is the malignant proliferation of mast cells. Mm -hmm. Uh, in asthma, there is chemotaxis of eosinophils, T cells, neutrophils, all because of mast cell degranulation. There's release of tryptase, prostaglandin 2, which activates eosinophils. Uh, histamine release will induce eosinophil migration, C3 upregulation, superoxide generation. It will cause tissue remodeling and fibrosis eventually in a severe persistent asthma. Uh, psychological stress can also induce degranulation, and mast cells have been uh, implicated in stress-related diseases of the skin, heart, brain, and bladder. Of course, in food allergy, there's IgE-mediated um, histamine release leading to anaphylaxis. We know about that. Um, it is also implicated in irritable bowel syndrome, where acute stress activates mast cells. And then chronic stress will cause hyperplasia of mast cells 
that will induce mast cell dependent bar barrier dysfunction. Mast cells have also been implicated in lichen planus, caused by substance P and other neuro neuropeptides. And then chymase and tryptase release will cause basement membrane disruption and TNF release implicated in interstitial cystitis, activates again by substance T, which causes inflammation leading to urinary frequency, urgency, and superpubic pain. Occasionally, we'll have someone with interstitial cystitis um, in the allergy clinic looking for an allergen. This is mainly a substance T or um, neuro release. OK, and the last slide I think I have is Uh, table 19.4 on page 439, it goes over examples of genes associated with atopic disease and asthma. So this one has a substantially changed in this newer book. But again, I can't, um, can't get this down. So some of the ones, though, I think in, that are important, to, well, probably they're all important to know, but in particular, filagrin um, was not really testable when I uh, went through boards and that old but it's probably going to be a hot topic for you guys, would be my guess. Or, or MDL3, I think, is an important one, ADAM33. Um, certainly the cytokines, the TH2 type cytokines, knowing uh, an association with those. Uh, CD14, uh, is, well, CD14 is long, it goes along. So CD14 associates with TLR4, so those, I think, are both fairly important to know. Any questions? Yeah. There's always more to learn, isn't there? There's always more to learn. Especially in technology. So. Any comments or questions from the audience? Oh, very good. Well, thank you, Dr. Chacha. Seems like as soon as you start to feel like you know the stuff, then you realize there's more to learn. It never ends. I guess that's job security for immunologists, and that's all right. Mm -hmm. uh, so ask Dr. Bialari if uh, the phenotypes of mast cells in the eye. Um, OK. And you can probably ask if uh, who are So Dr. Bialari, are you on? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? I hear you just fine. So Dr. Chacho had a question for you. Okay. I was wondering if you knew offhand what the different mast cell phenotypes were in different parts of the eye. My yeah, recollection the, was it's different from the conjunctiva to the everything else. There, <laughs> it's ironic that you asked that because there has been a study that looked at it about 20 years ago uh, with Nathea Allen Smith looking at tryptase and the chymo, uh, uh, chymotrypsin presence, the CT kind of scenario, and that's how the original connected tissue, and I've just started to gauge to try getting some whole eye tissues to redefine with more more recent um, types of assessments of the ocular components of the eye going into the uvea, uvea uveitic uh, processes because there are mast cells in, well, involved or they're present, whether they're clinically involved uh, obviously is a question because in the mouse model you mentioned chromalin. Actually, chromalin actually prevented a, an experimental allergic um, uveitis model from developing uveitis from the antigen uh, being induced. So, I mean, it is a fascinating area, but it's not well known. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we're going to stop this, com this uh, discussion now and uh, take a short break. This is Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City. We'll be back in two minutes and um, be joined by Dr. Bellary. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences on Line Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.